There's a term called POD24, which stands for progression of disease within 24 months. And this uh, illustrates or highlights a group of patients who are particularly high risk. They have significantly inferior overall survival uh, relative to their counterparts who don't have early disease progression. And if anything, is, is somewhat of an unmet medical need right now because these patients uh, are oftentimes going to be the ones who pass away from their disease and behave, frankly, a lot more like a, a large cell lymphoma. Uh, there have been some studies that uh, look at uh, repeat biopsy of those individuals in the setting of uh, early progression. And indeed, if you progress following bendamustine rituximab, there's a greater than 50% chance that you have histologic transformation. Uh, it could be even as high as three quarters of patients. So you're really in that situation dealing with a different type of lymphoma altogether, which is, which is more an aggressive large cell lymphoma. And uh, when somebody has an early progression of disease, then it becomes a, a very different pathway than the one we outlined where you might do lenalidomide, rituximab, or PI3 inhibitors. One of the main questions you would think about in that situation is whether or not a patient might be suitable for a stem cell transplant. And so the, the um, knowledge base around stem cell transplants is unfortunately pretty limited. In, in many cases, uh, these were data sets derived before the routine utilization of rituximab or their small studies. And so it's difficult to say definitively that this is the correct approach to go, but uh, for a patient who did not receive anthracycline therapy in the front line, you might consider our CHOP, uh, uh, you might consider our EPOC. Um, if they had received a, a prior anthracycline, you might consider our GDP. And for those patients who are both um, suitable for transplant uh, in terms of fitness and, and organ function and have a favorable response to that sort of salvage therapy, autologous stem cell transplant could be considered. On the other hand, some patients aren't going to be suitable for transplant and you're really working more on a palliative approach at that point to just slow the disease down. Um, and there's really a fair bit of uncertainty right now for where the role of chimeric antigen receptor T-cell therapy could fit in this space. I think that's an area we'll see uh, data emerging over the next several years. Unfortunately, we don't currently have tools uh, to prospectively identify who's going to be an early progressor. Uh, in addition to Flippy uh, and Flippy 2, there's a new thing called the M7 Flippy that begins to look at some of the molecular details. Uh, that's not necessarily broadly available, and uh, there too, it can be difficult to pro, uh, prospectively utilize these tools to determine who's going to be an early progressor. So unfortunately, we're left in the field with um, early progression being a determination sort of after the fact rather than beforehand. It is probably true that those patients with higher flippy might have a higher likelihood of, of an adverse outcome. That much is reasonable, but there's not a, a sort of a one-to-one -one prediction there that, that would link those two tightly enough for us to use that as a means to predict who's going to experience early progression.